saying grace How sweet the sound That saved a rich like me The resurrection was quite a day for Mary Now, the truth of the matter is we will all see our loved ones in that day of resurrection. But in that whole discourse in my heart, as I looked at my passage on the resurrection, I thought about Mary. She had lost a son. She had lost her firstborn. But she had lost a lot more than that in that she knew he was the Christ. But she, like all Old Testament believers, thought he was going to bring the kingdom. Didn't understand the spiritualness of the kingdom until he was raised from the dead. And so there is hope. For sure there is hope. And the importance of bringing your children to a faith in Christ. For one day you will see them again. That will be a glorious day. And it's all based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every bit of it. So I want to talk about that today. Death swallowed up into victory. I mean, it, when does that victory take place in your life? The moment you believe. Death is swallowed up in victory the moment you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's positional, isn't it? experientially absent from the body, be present with the Lord, you're going to go like, that's going to be one of those wow moments. It's not going to be just the empty tomb, it's going to be the person of the empty tomb is going to be alive. It's going to be quite a moment. It's going to be quite a moment in your life. In our, in our passage of 1554 and so, people miss what the writer is, Paul is quoting out of Isaiah 25, uh, 8, when he says, death is swallowed up. Death is swallowed up into victory. Who is swallowing what? Whoever's swallowing this is swallowing what? Death. He's, right? And this word swallow in the Greek language means to drink every bit of it down. Kind of like your medicine type thing. You take it all. You measure it out and drink it all. Katra pino, pino means to drink, and kata means completely down. You drink it all down. We know what's being swallowed, and we know it's going to be swallowed up into victory. Agreed? But who's swallowing it? Well, verse 57 tells you. Look at verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the one who swallowed death, right? See? Because whoever swallows it, death is what's going to be swallowed, and whoever swallows it is going to get victory. And so he tells you in verse 57, Jesus Christ drank death completely to give us victory. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. And what a wonderful Mother's Day understanding of the Word of God that will be. Especially for those mothers who have lost children, like Mary. It's not Mary, did you know? It's Mary, when did you know? That brought the joy back into your life. 
that brought the understanding of God's great plan and changed your whole attitude about who Jesus was in his first coming and that there would be a second coming that Mary could be a part of. Because Mary became a church-age believer in the book of Acts, identified with the church. Do you know how significantly important that is? Because when Mary stood at the tomb of her son, she thought he had gone to Sheol, rightly so, and that she wouldn't see him again until the day of the resurrection. And not only, not only did she see her son come back from there and then remembered his teachings on it, but when Mary died, she got to be with her son in heaven. Not in Sheol. She got to be with her son in heaven who was now seated on the throne of authority. But for him to get there, which she thought she would have that privilege while he was alive, she didn't get it except through his death, burial, and resurrection. So this is a pretty powerful passage. Death has been swallowed up completely. So the second question is, we know who drank it, we know what he drank, and we, we know there's victory from him, from Jesus drinking death completely, 100%. He didn't drink part of it, he drank all of it. Right? And there is victory as a result of that. Victory over what? death. So the question is, what death did Jesus die? Right? Well, we say spiritual. You would be right in general terms on that. So tonight, we're, or today, we're going to look at this subject matter. I find it interesting, point number one, I find it interesting that the world thinks more about life being swallowed up than death. You talk to the average person, it's called counseling. You talk to the average person, they're talking about life being swallowed up, not death. I never hear anybody talk about death swallowed up. But I do hear a lot of people talk about their life being swallowed up. In fact, listen to me, there is, there is a psychology term for that. There, there's a term in psychology for this, and listen what they call it. Now, they, they've may have thrown this out since I got my degree. When I went through psychology training, they called it the Jonah complex. They called it the Jonah complex. And here's, here's how this psychology of life being swallowed up. The Jonah complex says, just when you think life couldn't get worse, a great fish comes along and swallows it. Now, we've heard part of that, haven't we? Just when you think, think things couldn't get worse. That's the Jonah complex. It's a psychology. In psychology, when I was in it, they called it the Jonah complex. Just when you think life couldn't get worse, a big fish comes along and swallows it. Swallows your life. We often hear phrases like this. When a person dies younger than expected, the world will say things like, she died before her time, or she died in the prime of her life, and they'll mourn over it. Not over the death as much as the timing. <clears throat> that made me think a little bit about a guy like Abraham. 
because all believers in Jesus Christ have a different view about life and death. Or they should have. And if they're students of the Word of God, they certainly do. For example, many years ago, I read this in Genesis 25.8, and it just struck me so, uh, so important. Listen to how God, I always like to read, I know, but I like to read obituaries in the Bible. I like to hear what God says about somebody. And I call them obituaries in the Bible. And there are a lot of them. And let me tell you, when God gives you an obituary, you've got a super grace moment. God is, God, when he gives an obituary, he's going to give you something out of that. Here's what he says about Abraham. This is what he said in Abraham's obituary. He says, Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age. An old man satisfied with life and was gathered to his people. God's obituary on Abraham. He died at 175 years of age. And God said, a ripe, a ripe old age, an old man satisfied with life, and gathered to his people. You know, if you want to get a look at what God would like to see in your journey as you come to die in grace, that would certainly be that. I can't tell you how many people I meet who go to dying grace dissatisfied with their life. A ripe old age means that they're really content and on top of their game. On top of their game. A ripe old age doesn't mean that he stinks. Although that may be true. But somebody who is still on top of the game. Still on top of it. And by that I mean with God. Still on top of the game with God. Still satisfied with life. God's impressed with that. And then God says, and gathered to his people. That good. <laughs> I find that concept of gathered to his people in the word assembly. Do you know how important it is, Hebrews 10.25, forsake not your assembling together? When I find people struggle with that in their life, I think, how are they going to, because this gathered to his people is the same concept. I mean, you go to heaven, you know, what you're, you know what heaven is identified as? The church. The church of Jesus Christ is going to come back with him for the living church of Jesus Christ. In Galatians, the third chapter, verse 16, still speaking to Mo, about Moses. Well, in Galatians 3, 8, still speaking about Moses. Listen to what, listen to what Paul grasped. He says, the scriptures foreseeing. How about that? The scriptures foreseeing. I mean, that's what we do when we study the second coming of Christ. The scriptures foreseeing important issues about Christ. The scriptures foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Look, down, look how far the corridor he went down. Abraham. Listen, that scripture, Paul saw that scripture when that was given to Abraham in his, in the, called the Abrahamic covenant, was able to look all the way down to the Jewish nation that would reject the Messiah and another nation would replace them called the Gentiles. You can read it in, in Acts 13, over there in about 46. G 
Jesus told them that. He told the Jews, this is going to be taken from you and given to another. He did a parable on it. He dealt, dealt with it. You're going to kill the son, throw him out, and he's going to take, what should he do? Oh, they said they ought, he ought to really get him. And he said, well, he's going to do it to you. He's going to take it from you and give it to somebody who's worthy. The scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, said all the nations will be blessed in you. And that ought to be a big, big why. That you is Christ. That you is not Abraham. That you is Christ. And he talks about it in Galatians 3.16. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say unto seeds as referring to many, but rather to one. When John the Baptist came, he baptized all kinds of Jews in order to find the one who would be called the Christ. In John the first chapter. When Paul talks about the gospel... He talks about it in terms of the scriptures. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, when, when we got into the subject of, of Corinthians, Paul, Paul says the, the, the gospel according to the scriptures, that it was according to the scriptures that Christ died and was buried. It was according to the scriptures. He's talking about the scriptures that could see way down the pike. He's talking about Old Testament scriptures that were on the money in foresight of what we are now living in reality of time. That's pretty amazing, people. That's pretty amazing stuff. Secondly, the phrase death swallowed up into victory is taken from a messianic passage from the book of Isaiah. This is no accident because this is one of the great books on the Messiah. In Isaiah 25 Verse 8, he uses this in regard to the Messiah. And we miss things. For example, he says he will swallow up death. That's our passage, right? But didn't say, listen, didn't say in victory. It said for all times. To understand the importance of this concept, that Christ would die one death for all times. What the writer Isaiah is teaching, that Christ would die one death for all times. Do you know who picked that subject up? If you know anything about the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, 9, and 10, that's a line in it that comes right out of this passage. Christ died one death for all times. You can read it. For example, I wrote a couple of scriptures down just for you to look. You can read it in, in Hebrews 9.26. You can read it in good detail on Hebrews 10, 10 through 14. Or, or he died once for all time. That's what Isaiah is teaching. He, will, he, the Messiah, will swallow up death for all times. How will he do it? The cross. On the cross. On the cross. That's what the writer of Hebrews picked up. Picked up this line out of Isaiah. He picked this line up out of Isaiah, and Paul is now teaching great links on it out of Corinthians. The disciples were all over this subject. He will swallow up death for all times. And the, listen to this now. Listen to the second line. And the Lord will wipe away tears from all their faces. You know where that's quoted? That's quoted by John in Revelation 21.4 and is preached at almost all funerals you've ever been at. Right? No more death, no more tears, no more suffering, no more pain. Right? You know where that comes from? Isaiah 25.8. Fulfilled in Jesus Christ. For all time. That passage in Revelation 21.4 is right out of Isaiah 25 and fulfilled by the person of Jesus Christ who went to the cross and died for our sins and was buried and raised from the dead the third day. See, a lot of times we don't pay any attention. To that. That's a powerful messianic passage. Would you agree? Isaiah 25.8. No doubt that's messianic. And then he says... And he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. 
And then it says, for the Lord has spoken. In other words, Israel's role. All believers of all generations will one day uh, reign with him in the new heaven and new earth. Therefore, we have Isaiah, Paul, and John all associating this verse with Jesus Christ. He, the Messiah, he, the Christ. This is what Paul's talking about in our passage. This is what John is talking about in Revelation 21. And this is certainly the point that Isaiah was making in the 25th chapter. However, when you're looking at Isaiah, you don't see a first coming and a second coming. You just see a coming. We didn't know there was a first and second coming in the Old Covenant. We didn't know it until the church came into existence and separated the two comings of Christ. The church of Jesus Christ sets in between the two comings of Christ. We didn't know that. That was one of the great mysteries. This is very important to us. Here's the third thing. The third thing is the word swallow. I mentioned it in my introduction. I now wrote it on the paper for you, kata pino. And this word kata pino is important because it means to drink something down completely. That's the reason kata is on it. The other, just pino means to drink. This word is used in a hyperbole. A hyperbole, just taking something and just exaggerating so far that it makes no sense, therefore you get the point. Right? This is that one in Matthew 23, 24, when it says, you blind guides who strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. That's a hyperbole. And listen, the word swallow... <laughs> I mean, just the, trying to picture it in your mind. It means to swallow the whole camel right down to the hoof. <laughs> this is the word that's used. He's not talking about a cigarette. I don't even know if they have camels anymore, do they? I don't know. It's been so long. I have no idea. I never could stand the taste of them. I never even tried a camel. In 2 Corinthians 5.4, it is used for, and in the same context of Corinthians 15. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal is swallowed up by life. And he's talking about eternal life. Because mortal, listen, the other side of mortal is immortal. And he, Paul equates immortal, immortal with eternal life. That's Zoe with a definite article. That's Zoe life. That's eternal life. That's where your victory is. Paul says, when this perishable will put on imperishable, when the mortal will put on immortality, then, see the when and the then? See the when then? Eh, pay attention to that. I put in bold print so you wouldn't miss it. When this, then, will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up into victory. See that? And Paul, in verse 52, 52, 53, and 54 of 1 Corinthians, he uses this perishable and imperishable. Here's the fourth point. The death that is swallowed up in victory is the death of Adam's sin. Where did this death come from? What's the origin of the death that Jesus swallowed on the cross that give us the victory? We have no more that death. That death is no more. What is that death? See, that's Adam's death. That's Genesis 2.17. Don't eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the, day, in the day you eat of it, dying you will die. That's muth. That's the Hebrew word. Dying you will die. Or the English says you will surely die. We know what he's talking about because they didn't physically die right away, but they did spiritually. It's a spiritual death. It's a Romans 
It's in Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death through sin. It is the sin death that Jesus swallowed completely. No more death related to sin. No more death related to sin. Spiritual death is done. And he goes on to discuss that in our passage. Oh, oh, where is the sting of sin? The law. Well, Christ solved that problem too, didn't he? Because he's the end of the law. He's the fulfillment of it. Through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men for all have sinned. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in our passage of, of our study, of, not our passage, but our Corinthians 15, At, in Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. In Adam all die. This is the death that he, he swallowed completely down. In, in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 17, for if by the transgression of the one, Adam, death reigned through the one, Adam, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign through the one, Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, he's going to refer to a first Adam and a last Adam. And the last Adam is Jesus Christ. So here is the death. Listen, this is the death that he drank so that you could have the victory over death. You don't, not only do you not want to live without God in time, you do not want to die without God for eternity because there's a second spiritual death awaiting you, the lake of fire. And that's the absolute truth, and you need to believe it. Here's, here's point five. This important point, the justice of God was satisfied, the justice of God was satisfied by the judicial penalty of Adam's sin when it was fully paid by Jesus Christ on the cross. You, if, you want that, if you want that spiritual death removed from your life, you have to go to the cross to get, it, to get the exchange. You go to the cross, you can exchange your death because he took it, and he will give you righteousness and eternal life. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. See, it is the justice of God that demands a just penalty. And his son bore that for us so that we wouldn't have to bear it. This is brought out in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, 12 through 15, when he says... He talks about an eternal redemption, an eternal spirit, and an eternal inheritance. He uses that word three times in that passage, eternal. Listen to me, and this is so important to Paul. The proof, listen to me now, the proof that Jesus drank the spiritual death down completely is his resurrection. Because that's where the victory is. No victory without a resurrection. Listen, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19, he said, listen, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, you are still in your sin, and your faith is worthless. How about that? That's pretty strong language. The proof that Jesus strength, the spiritual death down completely on the cross is the proof is the resurrection. This is what Mary got. This is whatever mother should get this, this holiday. Listen, if you're a believer and your son's a believer, you'll see him again. You'll see him again. Because of the resurrection, and there's where victory is over death. There's victory in that. You need to have that victory now in your heart. You need to have a sense of that victory. I've said this many times to my congregation because I've been here so long. But I can remember as, a, as if I, the day I stood with my grandmother as she began to bury her, her children one by one. She outlived most all of them. 
And I stood where there is, as she lost her sons, lost them really early in life. And her m murmur is just not right that a parent should ba bury a child. It's just not right. I'm certain, certain Mary thought that way. What has he done to deserve this? All he's done is done good all of his life. Some of the people at the wedding were at the crucifixion. Some of those people at, that, at the first miracle, at the wedding that we... We went so far out of our way to help. I was shocked to see them. I was shocked to hear them say, crucify him, crucify him. I was shocked to see many of the people that he had helped along the way and done good things to. But all that turned to joy in the morning. Joy in the morning. All turned to joy in the morning. When Jesus discovered not only... And listen, I've often thought of it. Probably the second person that found joy in the morning was John. Because he wasn't, wasn't going to have, have to take Mary to be his mother. And then realized before he left... Oh, you really are going away. And so by the, by the time he ascended, John was back to taking care of Mary. See how all that spins around the resurrection of the power of the rich. Death. The death of Adam's original sin will be an issue until the end of the human race at the second coming of Christ. Hebrews 9, 26 through 28. Jesus said, then comes the end when, the hand, when he hands over the kingdom of God and Father to his Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all of his many enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. That is, until the last human being makes a ch choice. Until the last human being. You talk about 2 Peter 3, 9. God is long-suffering that none would perish, but that all would come to salvation. If you have a parent, listen to me now. If you have a parent that has lost a child, make a special effort today to minister to that person. You have no idea unless you've lost a child yourself, you have no idea. It still burns in my soul after all of these many years. I was a college student when my grandmother first lost her first child, and I can remember that in her soul as if it happened yesterday. I say to you, there'll be joy in the morning, but there's sadness in the day. So make a special occasion. You may not be able to call your mother today, like Jane and I talked about on the way to church, but maybe you could call somebody's, somebody's mother, especially that mother who's lost a child, who needs to be encouraged today. This is a, of all the, all the parts of the year, it's sad. This is sad for them. Let us pray. We're thankful, Father, that your son drank death down completely that we might have victory, and, and there is victory. There is victory in Mother's Day. And even though as believers we know that, as my grandmother said, it just doesn't seem right in the course of life 
that a parent should bury a child. And so for all those mothers today, both here in the sound of our voice of our church, through the internet, to those out in America and beyond our border, I say to you that there is victory over death, but only in Jesus Christ. Believe that he died on that cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. Would you believe that the gospel, Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes. You need that comfort today. And if you know a person who has lost a child, make a phone call today. Tell them you love them. Tell them you've been thinking about them. Tell them you're there for them. If they need to call and talk to you, they can call and talk to you. Make a special effort today, Father, through your people to touch people who have lost people and are struggling with it in their soul. That need a word of comfort. Christ has swallowed it up into victory. Live in the victory. For we've made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amazing grace How sweet the sound That saves